Hi, my name is Connie Hoklanis and you're watching the video on muscle sequelae in incompetent strabismus. And muscle sequelae is a set of adaptations seen of the extraocular muscles that occurs in response to one of those muscles being palsied. Now, in order to gain an understanding of the muscle sequelae, it's first important to revisit the laws of innovation, and specifically two laws of innovation. Herring's law of equal innovation and Sherrington's law of reciprocal innovation. Let's start off with Herring's law. This indicates that when an impulse goes to a muscle, causing it to contract, what must also happen at the same time is that the contralateral synergist, also known as the yoke muscle, must receive simultaneous and equal innovation. If we look over to the right, we have, um, I've included here an ocular motility simulator that is available on the web at the link below. And I've simulated a pair of eyes that are looking into right gaze or dextroversion. And in this simulator, an orange muscle indicates one that's contracting and a yellow muscle one that is relaxing. And what we have here is very lightly, we can see that the lateral rectus of the right eye is contracting and the yoke muscle of that um, uh, of the lateral rectus, the medial rectus of the left eye is also contracting. So here we have a demonstration of Herring's law where the yoke muscles are receiving equal and simultaneous innovation. Okay, on the other hand, we have Sherrington's law of reciprocal innovation. This indicates that when an increased innovation is sent to a mass muscle to contract, what must happen at the same time is that the ipsilateral antagonist or the direct antagonist must relax and therefore there must be a decreased amount of innovation that goes to this muscle. Okay, again, if we look over to the right at the Ophelmotilia simulator, what we see here is that whilst for the right eye, the lateral rectus is contracting, the ipsilateral antagonist, the medial rectus of the right eye is relaxing. And if we look over to the left eye, whilst the medial rectus is contracting, the lateral rectus is relaxing. Sherrington's law also implies that the state of tension of the contracting muscle or the agonist is also exerting a regulatory influence on the state of tension of the antagonist and vice versa. Okay, so overall, these laws of innovation uh, govern what we see as the muscle sequelae. So now let's look at um, or discuss the muscle sequelae. To do this, I'll take you through an example of a right lateral rectus palsy. And what you see before you is a pair of eyes, and I've uh, documented here the extraocular muscles in their field of action. Okay, so if we have a right lateral rectus palsy, what we will note is an underaction of this muscle as we've had a loss of function of the lateral rectus. Okay, now the lateral rectus is utilised um, or is assessed in right gaze, in dextroversion. So you can imagine that if the patient is attempting to look into dextroversion, that excessive innovation will go to that lateral rectus to try and achieve abduction. Now, if excessive innovation is going to the lateral rectus of the right eye, due to Herring's law, the yoke muscle, the left medial rectus, must also receive excessive innovation. As such, we will see an overaction of the yoke muscle, the left medial rectus. Okay, this is actually the first element of the muscle sequelae. There are two more. The next is we will see an overaction or contracture uh, of the right medial rectus. Contracture is the inability of a muscle or a contracted muscle to relax. And in this instance, this occurs due to Sherrington's law, and we see contracture of the muscle as the right medial rectus is unopposed by the lateral rectus, which is now underacting. Now, the final component of the muscle sequelae is we will note a secondary inhibition or an underaction of the left lateral rectus. This is governed by Herring's law, and the reason we see an underaction of the left lateral rectus is because the yoke muscle, the right medial rectus, 
um, now requires less innovation to AD duct as it's contracted. Okay, that is overall the muscle sequelae. Now it's important to note that when a patient recently acquires a muscle sequelae, you may not see all four components of the muscle sequelae. Uh, most often what will be noted first is the underaction of the pausing muscle and the overaction of the um, contralateral synergist. And the next, um, the other elements may um, present later in time or be clinically observable later. Okay, so just bear in mind that you do not need to see all, um, all overactions and underactions that we've just discussed to conclude that a patient has a neurogenic palsy. Okay, let's go through um, those points that I've just made with one more example, and this time I've selected a vertical muscle and we'll look at a left superior oblique palsy. So here we've got a left superior oblique palsy, so what we would expect is an underaction of that muscle. We would also expect that the yoke muscle or the contralateral synergist, the right inferior rectus, will be overacting due to Herring's law. We also expect to find that we will see a contracture or an overaction of the ipsilateral antagonist, the left inferior oblique. And we'll see an underaction uh, or secondary inhibition of the contralateral antagonist, the right superior rectus, due to Sherrington's, sorry, due to Herring's law. Okay, um, now before concluding the video, I just want to come back to Miss Jones, our case study, and highlight where in the actual patient notes would we be looking for the muscle sequelae. So clearly, you'll be taking a look at the ocular movements or the ocular movement assessment is what will be guiding you as to whether a muscle sequelae is present. In Miss Jones's case, what we can see is the orthoptist has indicated a right inferior oblique overaction and a right superior oblique underaction, uh, both of which, uh, sorry, the pair meeting requirements of a muscle sequelae. We have a couple more notes around AV patterns and um, a documentation that the obliques of the left eye look okay. Um, but in essence, it's that, that first documentation of the overaction and underaction that are um, supporting the possibility that this may be a neurogenic palsy. As always, you can never make a, a diagnosis of a single investigation. So we'll continue to look at Miss Jones and her um, case notes to diagnose her a little bit later when we um, have a complete picture uh, and understanding of the clinical investigations in incompetence to business. Okay, just to note also that the other um, investigation that you can utilise to look at the muscle sequelae and to observe under and over actions is the HES chart. But there is a specific video dedicated to this and I will take you through how to interpret the HES chart. But this is also going to be useful in looking for the muscle sequelae. Okay, so finally in summary, when we have a neurogenic palsy, uh, a muscle will be underacting due to the impaired, uh, due to its impaired function, and what will follow from this is the muscle sequelae, which consists of one, the overaction of the contralateral synergist, two, contracture of the ipsilateral antagonist, and three, secondary in inhibition of the contralateral antagonist. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of this video on muscle sequelae.